Hello everyone, welcome to the channel, my name is Cordant and in this video I'm bringing you a list of tips for people uh, who are new to Baldur's Gate, players wanting to try out the game for the first time and this is based on questions I've received in my comment sections throughout my videos. Uh, it's also based in personal experience when I first started playing Baldur's Gate all those years back, things I struggled with as well as some stuff that I see on Reddit being asked or friends of mine trying out the game. So I made a, a collection of things that I think are relevant to explain to new people which are not very obvious. This is a very old game. This is the kind of game that came to you with a manual that you had to read to learn and understand. Otherwise you kind of just have to play the game and through trial and error you can you kind of understand what's going on. <laughs> In any case, like I said, this is mostly for new players. If you are an experienced player, if you've played Baldur's Gate a bunch of times already, probably a lot of the stuff I'll be covering will not be news to you, but by all means, feel free to to stay and <laughs> and listen to what I have to say and then you can leave some criticism or some feedback at the end of the video. Um, so uh, I would also say if, if you enjoy the content, uh, if you want to see more, uh, feel free to leave a like or consider subscribing if you want to see more of this. It's the, the best way to support my channel for free. So, without further ado, let's begin. Let's start with character creation. So the first thing you're going to do is create a new game where you'll be presented with the character generation screen. This is where you are going to be creating your main character. So this is very familiar to other RPGs, nothing very new. Uh, you can pick your gender, male or female, it is completely irrelevant in Baldur's Gate if you pick one or the other. There's no stat changes, no attribute changes, they both do the same thing, so just pick whichever you prefer. And then you'll be presented with a selection for race. And this I would say is your first big choice in terms of character creation. For a new player, in my opinion, there are two main things that you should take into consideration while picking your race. And the first one is role-playing value. So if you start clicking the races, you will see a small lore description as well as some of their advantages and disadvantages. Every race has some kind of unique property. Okay, they are all different. But in terms of role-playing value, uh, me, for example, I just love playing with the shorty races. <laughs> I like playing with a dwarf or a halfling or a gnome, for example. There's something about seeing my, my tiny character running throughout the battlefield doing whatever he's doing that brings me a lot of joy. And that's not something irrelevant, okay? <laughs> picking a race that you enjoy, picking something you like playing with is very important in my opinion. It is more important uh, for the enjoyment of the game rather than starting to think about metagaming and super min-maxing. I would say pick something that you enjoy the idea of playing with and and use that as your main baseline for your character okay uh, i will use a human for an example in the video but for me dwarves halflings and gnomes are my favorites <laughs> uh, you might be someone who likes playing with elves pick whichever you prefer the second thing that's very important is every race is going to have a certain number of classes available to them so, for example, a human can be a fighter, he can be a ranger, a paladin, he can be any of these classes, okay? These are the classes available to him. If I were to look at, for example, a dwarf, we can see that the number of classes are not the same. So, for example, if you wanted to play a paladin, uh, you would need to pick a human, because the human is the only race that can play as a paladin, sadly. I wish dwarves would also be able to play as a paladin, but that's something different. We are going into mod territory and I will not be going into mods in this video. <laughs> but still, uh, you are going to want to see which of the races that you like have the class that you want to play. Okay. Other than that, you can just click on them, go through them, see their advantages and disadvantages. That might be relevant for you pick whichever one you prefer. But the most important to me, like I said, is the role-playing value and the class you have available for you. So just pick the combo you enjoy and go with it. 
So I'm going to use as an example here the fighter and there's an extra layer to this. So not only do you pick your class, you are also going to be presented with a kit. A kit could also be called a subclass, it's pretty much the same thing. And you can pick between the kits available to you. You can ignore the Psy Warrior, this is from a, a very cool mod that I'm using. <laughs> the ones available to you would be the Fighter, the Berserker, Wizard Slayer, Kensai and Barbarian. So just like the race, every single one of these kits is going to have something unique to it. It's going to have advantages, it might have disadvantages, or you can also just pick the, the baseline fighter class that doesn't have advantages or disadvantages. You can just see whatever is available to you. If you want to play a berserker that can enrage, that's something you might want. If you want to be someone who's re resilient against mages, you might want to try out a wizard slayer. Just look at the, the stats that they have and you can pick whichever one you prefer. As an example, I'll just take the baseline fighter here. The other thing we can talk about is alignment. So alignment in Baldur's Gate is pretty much only for role-playing purposes. Nothing is really going to change throughout your game if you are a good character, a neutral character or an evil character. The only thing that actually changes in the game, not change, the only thing that affects, um, that alignment affects in the game is some very rare item restrictions. Some items will say only a good character can wield this. Other, uh, other items will say, for example, only lawful characters can use this or only evil characters. But this is a, a very small percentage of the items throughout Baldur's Gate, so I wouldn't stress about it if you are just trying out the game now. Um, this is really mostly for role-playing purposes. So, for example, if you want to play a Paladin, which is something that a lot of people enjoy, and the Paladin is a very good class, uh, you will want to play as Lawful Good. And also, some classes will actually restrict the alignments you get to choose. Um, so, let, let's use the example of the Paladin. If you want to play as a Paladin, you will usually want to play as a Lawful Good character, so you would want to go throughout the game world and help other NPCs, um, uh, do the good endings for the quests, just generally play as a good lawful person. So you could pick the alignment for lawful good. If you are someone who wants to kill everything it sees and you want to betray quest givers and go the evil route, sure, go for it. Pick an evil character. That's fine. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, if you are someone who doesn't really care about good or evil, you might want to play as a neutral character. If you want to role-play as a druid, you can play as true neutral. But like I said, this is mostly role-playing value. Don't worry too much about this. Just pick whichever way you like playing the game. In my opinion, if this is the first time you are playing the game, picking a good or neutral aligned class and role-playing as that is usually the best way to go about the game for the first time. Because everything will feel more natural. Uh, if you are playing as evil, some choices might not be obvious to you what it's gonna happen, okay? So let's pick Lawful Good. And now we have the abilities. So something in Baldur's Gate and in many, many other RPGs, you can pick the, the stat line for your character. Different stats are gonna be important for different classes. If you click on any of the stats, you are going to get a small description of what they do, nothing very detailed, and it's also going to show you the minimum and maximum stat for your particular race and class. Okay? For example, for this human fighter, I cannot go below 9 strength and I cannot go over 18 strength. For other characters, this might change, and other races as well. For example, a dwarf cannot have more than 16 charisma, just an example. So, um, I will go through them one by one. Strength, it, it's very simple. This will measure a character's muscle, endurance and stamina. What this means is, it will affect how hard you hit, the higher the strength, the more damage you do, 
and it will also affect your chance to hit your opponents. So strength will also define how well you can actually hit your enemies, not only how hard. And the final thing is every character in Baldur's Gate is going to have a weight limit for their inventory. You can carry a certain amount of items with you and there is also a maximum amount of weight you can carry. The more strength you have, the more weight you can carry. If you are a fighter, for example, I would say the more strength, the better. So let's say I want to have more strength. I can just lower some other stat that's not very important. Let's say, for example, wisdom. And I can increase my strength score. So something that's going to be different in strength here than any other stat, and this is only for strength, you are going to see this slash 94. What this means is if you are playing a warrior type class, something like a fighter or a paladin or a ranger, um, your strength score is not only going to be maxed by 18. It's actually going to be 18 slash and then a roll between 0 and 100. The higher it goes, the better for you. This is actually a very, very good roll. And something to note, if you roll 18 slash 0, 0, that's not bad. That's not 0. That's actually 100. That's the best result you can get. <laughs> when I started playing it, the playing the game, I got a 0, 0 and I thought, oh, this sucks. The 0, I don't want this. Uh, let's just re-roll. That's a mistake. 0, 0 is 100. It's the best value available. <laughs> um, in terms of dexterity, this will measure a character's high and high coordination, agility, reflexes and balance. This isn't a very good description for what it actually does. This is mostly lore or role-playing purposes. Dexterity is actually one of the best stats you can get for um, your characters if you are starting out the game. Because dexterity uh, will improve your overall defenses. It doesn't matter which class you are, this will affect your defenses. This is good for a warrior, it's good for a cleric, it's good for a mage. It's good for every single class in the game. This will just make you harder to hit in general. So it's a good start to have. Other than that, it will also affect how well you can hit with a ranged weapon. Not how hard, just how well. More dexterity does not mean more damage with ranged weapons or any kind of weapon. It just means um, how effectively you can hit with your ranged weapons. Constitution will measure fitness, health, physical, blah, 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 blah. Uh, constitution, <laughs> pretty much what it means is the more constitution you have, the more hit points you have. That's, that's pretty much the, the main thing. If you are playing with certain races, for example, the shorty races, the more constitution you have, uh, you will also receive some bonuses to your saving throws. I will explain saving throws in a little bit. Uh, so for a fighter class, more constitution, the better. If you are playing with something like a mage or a sorcerer, keep in mind that 16 is actually the maximum value for which you will get benefits for. So you can put your mage's constitution to 18. This is just a waste of stats. 16 is the maximum for which you get a benefit for a mage or a sorcerer. Okay, so keep that in mind. Intelligence will define um, your ability to learn new spells on a mage or a bard and it will also affect the maximum number of spells you can have on your character. That's it. It will not affect how much damage you make with your spells, for example. That's something you might uh, think about by pl from playing other games. In Baldur's Gate, intelligence does not affect damage. So if you are a mage, you would want to max this because why not? It's easier to learn new spells, you have more spells and that's pretty much all you want on your mage. Uh, but just to note that if you see, for example, a companion with 15 or 16 intelligence, 
this doesn't mean he's gonna be a bad mage, okay? He's gonna he's still gonna be a very competent mage. In terms of wisdom, this uh, it says here it's a prime requisite of priests, and it's kind of accurate. This will it's the same thing as intelligence, but for divine casters. So a cleric or a druid or a shaman, for example, this will affect how many spells um, you have. And that's pretty much all it does. It's not gonna bump your spell damage. It's not gonna change anything else. It, it just says how many spells you can get as a divine caster. Okay, so very simple. And finally, Charisma. This is arguably the, the most underwhelming stat in the game. In terms of uh, mechanical abilities, something affecting your combat capabilities or your spell casting capabilities, Charisma does absolutely nothing. This is mostly for role-playing purposes and the way that NPCs in the game react to your presence. So, if you have a very high Charisma and you go into a store to purchase some kind of item, you are going to receive a discount, which is good. It's going to passively help you out throughout the game. Not in a very meaningful way, but it does help out. Um, certain companions, for example, if your charisma is very, very low, certain companions might actually even leave your party in certain situations. It's very specific, but it can happen. So, for a new player, I would say, keep your charisma at 10. That's, that's a perfectly reasonable score. You will not be hurt by having charisma at 10. And it's, it's kind of just a good baseline stat to have. So let's say I'm playing out a fighter. For fighter, like I said, important stuff is strength, constitution and dexterity. This would be a cool value for a fighter. If you want more dexterity, you can even just lower the wisdom and go for 18. Going below 10 on intelligence or wisdom for a fighter doesn't make much of a difference. So don't be afraid of lowering the scores. If you just want to have like a min-maxed version of the stats or you want more stats and you don't have enough points available, you could, for example, in a fighter, just dump your charisma score to 3. This will make no difference throughout the game. Okay? For your fighter, if your charisma is 3 or if your charisma is 18, it's the same thing. So that's, that's the stats here. And finally, we are going to go over the proficiencies. Proficiencies uh, are something that you can put some points in, into different weapons. What this means is that every class and every race will be able to use a certain amount of weapons. Since I picked a fighter, you actually have access to every kind of weapon in the game. You can use them all. But if you were playing, let's say, for example, a cleric, a cleric cannot use a katana, okay? A cleric cannot use a bastard sword, for example. Um, so the proficiencies, what they mean is you can place points into certain weapons. And this will just mean how proficient you are, how good you are at using that weapon. If you click on any kind of weapon, you're going to get the description here explaining to you what it actually does. So the first point will just mean that the character can use the weapon without any kind of penalty. And the more points you put in, the more benefits you're gonna hit. You're gonna have. You're gonna hit more often, you are gonna hit harder, and you might even have extra attacks per round. Okay? So if you are someone who says, oh I'm gonna make my my character uh, a samurai, so I'm gonna put all of my points into my katana. Sure, that means you are going to be very strong with the katana, not as strong with other weapons. One thing that's very important to note though, not having proficiency points in a weapon does not mean you cannot use it. You can still use any weapon that your class can wield. So, like the example I just gave, a cleric cannot use a bastard sword. So you will never be able to equip a bastard sword. You will not even have the option to put proficiency points in there. Okay? For a fighter, 
if I have all of my points in katana and scimitar, I can still use a short sword, I can still use a long sword or an axe. It just means I won't be as good wielding these weapons as I will with these right here. So just pick whatever you like, don't stress too much about it, but using weapons in which you are proficient with is advised. And then you just have the appearance and the name, and <laughs> you just pick whatever you like naturally. Um, something that I'm also going to mention here is multi-classing and dual classing. This is something that you might see if you start looking in the internet for uh, class guides or character guides, you are going to see a lot of discussion between multi-classes and dual classes or multi-classes versus dual classes. There's a lot of argument about that. My suggestion for new players is the following. Play a pure class. That's simple. That's easy. Uh, it will make sense for you. It's a perfectly reasonable choice. Or, at most, play a multi-class. A multi-class just means that you can pl your character can be both a fighter and a thief at the same time, or for example a fighter and a cleric, or a fighter and a mage. It depends on the race. Th these are the choices for the, the dwarf, for example. And what the multi-class means is you will have the abilities of the fighter and you will also have the abilities of the thief, and as you level up, your experience is going to be split between the fighter and the thief. So, in, in generally speaking, you, were, you will never be um, as good of a fighter as a pure fighter, and you will never be as good as a thief as a pure thief, but you are going to be someone that can do both things rather well. Dual classing, I will say... If you are a new player, forget about it, don't worry about it, you are not going to be missing out on something super mega important. I would say stick to your, to your pure class or at most a multi-class. Okay? And this is it for character creation. Now we're going to go for our next topic. Okay, so for the next topic I'm going to go over the UI. So, this is an example of me just starting out the game. Uh, if you are playing Baldur's Gate 2, this is where you would start your game. If it's Baldur's Gate 1, it's a different place, it's Candlekeep. But the UI is going to be the same, especially if you are playing the Enhanced Edition. And if you are a new player, I would recommend the Enhanced Edition. It has a lot of quality of life improvements and I definitely advise using the Enhanced Edition. So, for our UI, this is a very old-school UI. Nowadays, games don't usually have this kind of UI anymore. But I will just go over some of the, the points here so we can see them. So, the first thing we have is this little button right here, this red button, which might not seem like anything, but if you click it, it will actually just hide this side of the screen. This can actually be kind of useful because most of these things you have shortcuts for, but let's just go over them. The first button is just return to game. If you mouse over it, you're going to have a description. This just means if you go to the menu by pressing escape, you can click here to go back to the game. So this is something that nowadays you will just do <laughs> by using shortcuts. So escape to go to the menu, escape to go back to the game. But still, you have the, menu, the, the button right there. You have your map. This will show you the map of the location you are in. And you can also show the world map, so this is pretty familiar. Um, you can choose to whatever you want, and you can press the button to go back to the game, or just press M, it's the same thing. You will have your journal. Uh, right now it's pretty much empty, because we just started the game, you just have an entry here. In the journal you are going to have uh, bits of information to kind of contextualize what you are doing, and in your quest, you're going to get your quests. Nothing fancy here, pretty self-explanatory. Here you have your inventory, and I'll go through the inventory in a little bit, but this is the inventory for our main character, Ainsley, and this would be for Emoen, for example. Then we also have the record, the character record. This is where you will see 
the information about everything related to your character. And again, I will go into some more detail in a bit. We have our mage book. This is where our mage spells are going to be located if you have access to mage spells. We have the same thing for clerics, for priests. It's called the priest scroll. Since I'm not a priest, I don't have any kind of uh, divine spells available to me. You have your option screen. You have the quick save button. You have the help button and this, again, for new players, very helpful. If you press the help button, it's gonna say, this button will highlight other buttons on the main screen of the game. Select any of the highlighted buttons for information about their function. Let's say I don't know what this is, okay? So if you press help and then you press here, it's gonna tell you, this button is the cast spells button. It will open up the memorized spell list of the priest or wizard, blah, blah, blah. Same thing for, I press this one. It's going to explain. I press this one. It's going to explain. <laughs> so uh, naturally in this video, I'm going to be explaining them. But if you are in game and you have some kind of question about what a certain button does, the help feature is helpful. Then we also have a very important one, which is rest. And I will explain this one in a little while. And we also have a display showing us the current time of day. So the current time of day, there's a day-night cycle, nothing very fancy, but it can be relevant for you because some quests or some NPCs will only show up during daytime or nighttime correspondingly. So knowing what time of day is, is helpful. The other thing this does is it's also a button. If you click it, it will pause or unpause the game. And this is because the game plays in real time with pause, which is a topic I will be discussing in a little bit as well. So right now we're just talking about the UI. Right here is a very important thing. This is pretty much your log. This will give you information about things that are going on in the game. So it will show you dialogues. This is the dialogue I had when I was in the cage at the start of the game. It will show you this. You can go back to see what, uh, what you talked about, which topics were discussed. And if you are in combat, it will also show you something like um, the attack rolls, if you hit somebody, for how much damage you hit or got hit. Everything goes here. Very important feature. Pay attention to this. The second thing you have is this quick loot button. This will show you this little interface here which will highlight any item in the area. So if there were, for example, a sword in this position, it would show up a sword over here. If there was gold over here, it would show the sword and the gold, and you can just click the buttons to pick it up. This might seem a little bit weird, you picking up items by telekinesis, <laughs> um, but it is very helpful because, because in this kind of game, there's a lot of loot spread throughout throughout the, the areas. When you kill enemies, they will drop a lot of stuff. And this really just makes it a lot easier than just clicking every single enemy to pick up every single item. Trust me, this is a lifesaver. <laughs> this button right here is to talk. So if you want to talk to somebody, for example, an NPC, um, a companion, you can press the talk button then press the companion and you would engage in conversation if there was actually something to talk about. In this case, there isn't, so it doesn't do anything. Over here, we're gonna have our weapon slots. Right now, I don't have any weapon equipped, so the fist is gonna be what shows up over here. This will also allow you to swap between different weapons. If you had, for example, a sword and you also had a bow, you could swap between them by pressing these buttons. What else we have? We have these uh, moon and star items here, which are grayed out and they don't do anything. These are what are called the shortcut buttons in the game. They don't do anything by default, but you can customize them. So for example, if I left click it, it does nothing. But if I right click it, I'm gonna have an option 
to make a shortcut for one of my spells. So let's say I want to make a shortcut for the blindness spell. I could just left click it now and it's now memorized in this particular button. So this way, if I want to cast this spell, I don't have to go to my spell casting menu. I can just cast it from over here. Same thing for both these buttons. This button right here is reserved for using items. Right now it's grayed out because I don't have anything that can be used equipped. So if I had, for example, a weapon that can be equipped for some kind of effect or a ring or a cloak, anything like that, the way to use those items would be to press the use item button. It would show you a bar just like this one, but instead of showing you spells to show you the items, and then you could use the abilities from there. And over here, these are just quick items. Very familiar to other RPGs. You can place potions here. You can place scrolls. Something to have at hand during a fight. Okay, just, just another shortcut you can have. Finally, for this bottom bar, we also have the special abilities bar. This is where you are going to find um, abilities that your character has that isn't necessarily a spell. So let's say, let me see, for example, Imoen over here, she is a thief. So as a thief, she can actually lay traps. A trap isn't a spell, it's an ability. So if I want to lay a trap with a thief, I would go to my special abilities button, I would click that, I would click the trap, and I would place the trap in whichever position I would like. This is also useful for other classes, like paladins are going to have their abilities here, um, uh, monks as well. I mean, a lot of different classes are going to have a lot of different abilities, and this is how you activate them. For our right side panel, this is where we have our characters. So this is our main character. If you have a companion, they will also show up here. The maximum number of companions you can have is six. But you can play with a single one if you want. You can play with two, three, four, five, whatever you want. Over here, we have the reveal details button. Right now, it's grayed out. But if you click it, it gets highlighted. And what this does is it will highlight anything in the area that you can interact with. This is very, very useful. The other way you can use this is simply by pressing tab. So with tab, it's actually a, an on hold ability. So while I hold tab, it's going to show it. If I release tab, it no longer shows it. You can use this however you like, but it, it is a very, very helpful feature. It will show you something like doors you can interact with. It will show you items on the ground. Pretty much anything you can use, it's going to show you. This little button right here, this lantern, this defines the party AI. What this means is, if you have your characters with artificial intelligence assigned, something like, for example, let's say Imo in here. I will explain this a little bit more <laughs> in a little bit, but just for an example. Let's say we have Imoen uh, casting defensive spells and offensive spells as an AI script. Okay, so if I do this and I have AI enabled, if I unpause the game, She immediately casts Stone Skin on herself. This is a spell. And now I think she's casting armor. Right? Yeah. So, the, she's casting this by herself. I'm not clicking any buttons, I'm not casting any spells. This is her AI script working. In this case, she since she has used defensive spells as an AI option, she is going to cast long-lasting buffs on her by herself. So if you don't want to micromanage your characters all that much, you can have that enabled and they will cast those spells. If for some reason you want to shut down all AI temporarily, you can just click over here, it's grayed out. Now no AI script will play out, okay? This means 
several things. It can mean that your characters will not be casting spells by themselves, but it will also mean that if a fight starts out and you send, for example, your character to fight some kind of opponent, once he kills that opponent, he will just stand still. He will not automatically attack anybody else because attacking somebody else is AI. Okay? So if you have this off, there will be no AI playing on your characters. That can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Keep that in mind. The final button for the UI is the select all button. What this does is it simply selects every single character in your party. It's the same thing as doing this. Okay. So right now I, I only have one or I only have Imoen. And that is perfect. Time to move. You can select them just like an RTS. You can do it whichever way you want. If you have more than one character selected, you will note that the bottom bar has changed. Okay, so this is a single character. This is multiple characters. In here, you have an option to say attack, and you would tell both these characters to attack something. You also have the option to say stop. So if I say, for example, move over it's here. So, so simple to do. But I actually want them to stop moving. I can just press stop and they will stop. Okay, very simple. The final thing here is going to be these buttons here, and this is just the formation. Uh, this is particularly relevant if you have like four to six characters. It will just define how your characters are going to present themselves in uh, a formation. This will also take into consideration the order in which your characters are over here, because you can actually click and drag and you see that the mouse changes oh, come on. if you get it right and you, you can really, reposition really your right, characters in you your party so much in life shut up Ainsley. <laughs> so the the gray circle is your main character and the other ones are your other characters so that's it for the main ui i will go into some more detail about other things in a little while Okay, let's look at our inventory. I loaded up a different save so I can have some more stuff to show. And if we go to our inventory button, or if we just press I, we're gonna have this screen available for us. Uh, you can also swap between inventories of your companions by just pressing, just clicking on their portraits while the inventory screen is open. Okay. And this will show you what your character is carrying and what your char uh, character has equipped. So I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. Over here we have our bag and this is going to show you your weight limitations. So right here we have 70, I think these are pounds, I'm not actually sure. <laughs> uh, 70 is your maximum weight that you can carry. And over here we can see 23, this is our current weight equipped. This is the current weight we are carrying on this character both equipped weapons as well as weapons in our uh, items on our bag. If I'm carrying below 70, my character will move around normally. If I'm carrying over 70, he's going to start moving slowly. And if he has a lot more than 70, your character won't even be able to move. What affects this, like I said in the start discussion, is strength. The more strength your character has, the more weight he can carry. This is a mage, he has low strength, he has 10. If we were to go, for example, for Corgan, who is a fighter, he can carry 600. So it's a, it's a very big difference. Then we have this section right here. You can interact with these things. This is simply where you can store your items. You can place anything over here. Um, if your character can use the item or not, it doesn't matter. You can just carry anything you want in your inventory. If your character cannot use it, for example, a Warhammer, it will show up as red. Okay, But you can still carry it around. You can organize this in any way you want. Just the usual RPG inventory stuff. Okay, This should be very familiar. If you want to equip an item, you can simply drag it 
or you can click and then click and drop it in the appropriate slot. If you try to equip it where it doesn't go, it's going to tell you wrong item type. This is for a shield, this is for a cloak, so a cloak would go over here. Here you have the amount of gold that your party has. Gold is not distributed between characters. So, as an example, uh, in Divinity Original Sin 2, each character has a certain has the uh, the gold he has in his inventory. In Baldur's Gate, the gold is spread throughout the entire party. So, it's not character specific. It's the party's gold. Over here is where you can see items on the ground in your immediate vicinity, which means you can actually pick them up from this uh, UI. And this is also how you can drop items to the ground. So if I take my, my Warhammer here, I don't want it, I can just discard it on the ground right here. If I want to pick it back up, same thing, okay? Pretty easy. While we're talking about uh, taking things from one side to the other, this is also how you can give items to other characters. So you can click on your item and now you can just click on the portrait of the character you want to give it to and it will automatically place it in a free slot or you can click the item, you can click the number uh, related to the portrait, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So for Herd least, this guy right here, I can press 3, it will open up his inventory, and I can drop it right there. Okay? Very simple. Above this line, to the left, we have information about what our character, uh, our character currently has equipped. So, in his quick items, we have, in this example, some wands and an activatable item. This is also where we could place, for example, potions and other stuff, like scrolls. Let me see. I could take a scroll and place it here. And this just means that it's what's going to show up here, okay? These are like our, our shortcuts. Don't yell. And you can use I them over here. Just what is it now? Um... Over here we have our quick weapons. This just means that these are the weapons that are currently available to our character. A character, God. <laughs> and you can quickly swap between them uh, during combat. The reason why it says quick, it's because you have the choice to swap between the weapons right here. But if you are in combat, nothing actually stops you from just opening the inventory, clicking the weapon you want and replace it. Okay, you can do this mid-combat. Um, so here you can place your main weapons for your main hand. And here you can place a shield or, even though it only says shield, or you can place a, a secondary weapon. So for someone wanting to dual wield, for example, you could place your secondary weapon right here. Naturally, in the middle, this is where we have our character preview. You can also see the weapons. It's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, see how he looks like with his armor and all that stuff. So, pretty simple. Over here we have the quiver. And this is where we're going to equip our ranged ammunition. In this case, Edwin has a sling. And this is where we're going to place the ammunition for his sling. So, if I didn't have any ammunition, he doesn't even show the sling because he can't use it. There's no ammunition. If I equip, he's going to show it again, and you can now use a sling. If you have a bow, you'd put arrows. If you had a crossbow, you'd put bolts. Simple stuff. More to the middle, we have our equipable armor pieces. So we have our main piece of armor. Since we are a mage, we have a robe. We, uh, if we were a fighter, for example, we would have our, our plate mail or our shield mail. Shield mail? What? Our chainmail, <laughs> anything like that. Over here we have bracers. Here we have helmets. Okay. Here we have necklaces. This is pretty familiar, I'm sure. We can equip two rings. You can equip a cloak, a pair of boots, and a belt. Okay, so very simple stuff right here. 
To the right side, it's going to show you information about your combat uh, capabilities. Uh, I will go into some more detail in a different section, but just to show off, this first area here with this kind of shield item, this is your armor class. This is short for AC. Okay? Uh, this will just show you the number that represents your armor class, which means how hard it is for an enemy to actually hit you. Over here, we have our HP. This is our health pool, the amount of hit points that our character has. And by the way, to the right side is where you're going to see the bonuses and penalties you might have associated to the icon on the left. Over here, you have your Thaco. Your Thaco, or as some people call it, your Thac Zero, is your two hit armor class zero. This means that if you had to attack... Okay, I, I, I will not explain this just yet. <laughs> this means how easily you can hit an enemy in combat. Okay, I will explain it better in a little bit. And this final section is showing you the amount of damage that you do. So with your current weapon, our sling, and our current bullet, we are dealing 7 to 10 damage per hit. If I swap weapons, for example, Fire Tooth, my throwing dagger, will deal 5 to 11. If you're a fighter, especially if you're using two weapons, you can see two different values. This means that my main weapon, my axe, will deal between 17 and 24, and my offhand weapon will deal 13 to 18. So, this explains the inventory. Let's check out our next section. Okay, so let's talk about some combat-related stats. This is something that I briefly talked about in the inventory section, but it actually deserves a section of its own. Starting at the top, we have our armor class, or AC. This represents your overall defenses, uh, how likely it is for an enemy to be able to hit you. So it will be a number, in this case for Edwin it's 1, and if we look for example at Corgan, it's going to be a negative 9. So if you're a new player, and, or if you're just somebody looking at this, uh, your initial thought would be that this is pretty goddamn awful. His armor class, his defense value, is negative. If a person thinks about a defense value and sees a negative value, it, it's gonna think it's bad, okay, naturally. I, I did so at the start. But in Baldur's Gate, or more specifically in advanced second edition of the Dungeons & Dragons rule set, which is a rule set by which this game is based on, the lower the value, the better. This is a video for beginners, I'm not going to go into extra detail about this. Uh, just know that the lower the value you have here, the better it is for you. Don't be me, when I started playing the game, all of my frontline characters were walking around naked. Because, because I thought the higher the value, the better. And I thought that by equipping the armor, maybe he wasn't proficient with it, or there was some kind of penalty or a curse. Yeah, <laughs> so I was just dying all the time because I was walking around naked. The lower the value, the better it is. Hit points, ah, something else. Uh, regarding armor class and armor pieces, if you have a very good armor piece, for example, this armor here, this is a full plate mail, okay? This is kind of like the, the best type of armor you can get. If somebody attacks you, with a short sword, for example, any kind of weapon, if he attacks you and he hits you, you are going to take full damage, regardless. You are going to take the same damage as a naked character. Armor class only defines how likely it is for you to get hit. So, if you have a full plate, har a full plate male armor, it's going to be much less likely for an enemy to hit you than if you were walking around naked. However, if you do get hit, the damage you take while wearing armor or while naked is exactly the same. AC does not provide damage reduction. 
There is damage reduction in the game, but it comes by other means. Something like items. You can have an item that gives you resistance to damage. In this case, this is giving me resistance to physical damage, slashing, piercing and crushing. Uh, you also have items that give you resistance to other elements, like fire, for example. But just know that AC only defines how likely it is for you to get hit, not how much damage you take. Hit points is just your buffer. If you go below zero, you die. Also notably, if you go, I think, below negative 10 in a single hit, your character gets permanently killed. Okay, keep that in mind, but if you are a new player, my advice would be quick save and quick load and just continue playing. <laughs> For your Thaco, this is, I'm going to use Edwin as an example because it's easier, your 2 hit armor class 0. This is the value you need to roll in order to hit somebody whose armor class is 0. So in this case, Edwin would need to roll a 10 or higher in order to hit while Corgan has a much higher bonus. So just like in the AC department, the lower this value is, the better it is for you. In terms of damage, it's going to show you a range of damage your weapon can do. And over here, like I said before, this is showing you the, wep the weapon damage for your main weapon and then the weapon damage for your offhand weapon. The higher, the better. <laughs> In terms of damage, the more, the better. Okay, the final stat I want to talk about, or actually the, the final two stats I want to talk about, is first of all, saving throws. So saving throws is kind of like a, a spell defense, if you can think about it. So AC is for physical combat, saving throws is for mage combat. What does this mean? When you have, um, for example, your saving throw of paralysis, poison or death, this means that if an enemy casts a spell at you and that spell allows a saving throw, because not all of them do, this is your chance to resist that spell. In, in some cases, if you roll a good value for your saving throw, you will completely negate the enemy spell. In other cases, you will only take half damage, for example. Same thing as AC, same thing as Taco. The lower the value, the better you are. The way you can also check this, for example, if you have a spellcaster and you look at your spells, uh, let me see an example here. Well of the Banshee. So, for example, Well of the Banshee is going to say, those who fail a saving throw versus death die instantly. So, if somebody casts this, or if you cast this in, in an area with enemies, all of the enemies are going to be allowed to roll a saving throw versus death. And if they roll a value that allows them to save, they will not die. If they fail their roll, they will die. Okay, so just keep in mind, again, uh, the lower the value, the better it is. And finally, we have, where is it? Ah, our resistances. This is our final combat stat. This is very important, especially if you are playing against enemy spellcasters. Um, for example, if you go up against a mage, and it throws a fireball at you, you can have any kind of armor you want, you are going to take fire damage. The way to mitigate that fire damage is via resistances. And this section right here in your character record is going to show you exactly which resistances you have. So we have 90% fire resistance, we have 23% physical damage resistance, uh, some missile resistance, and also poison resistance. Okay? So that's it for our combat stats. Let's go for our next section. Let's talk a little bit about real time with pause. So that is one of the main aspects of the gameplay in Baldur's Gate. And that's what will allow you to properly handle fights and micromanage your party members 
without getting too confused about what's going on. So having six people in the same party and fighting a bunch of enemies can get very chaotic. There's a lot of micromanagement to do. Uh, you will want to move around your characters. You will want to issue commands like attack or cast a spell or drink a potion. Uh, whatever is needed and you're gonna have to do that time six at many many times during a fight if a fight is just playing out like a real-time strategy game where you cannot pause it's gonna be very confusing you're not gonna be able to do the things you want in the proper time maybe some people can I can't <laughs> and having the ability to pause the game at any time is exactly for this reason it's very very handy you can, uh, you can pause and unpause the game at any time by clicking this button right here at the bottom left or by simply pressing the space bar, which is a lot more handy, honestly. Um, this is something, like I said, that you should use in order to issue your commands when a, sta when a, when a fight starts or if you want to do something during the fight, especially spell casting and all that. Very, very handy feature. Also, something to note, if you go into your options menu, and if you go into your gameplay option, you are going to have this auto pause button over here at the bottom left. And if you click it, you are going to see a bunch of options. And this is to choose the conditions under which the game should automatically pause. So what does this mean? If we check something like character injured, this means that when one of your party members is seriously injured, in this case he is reduced to fewer than 30% hit points, the game will automatically pause. This is just so you have time to react and do whatever it is you need instead of noticing that the character is injured a little bit too late and then he dies and you couldn't react. So this will help you out in that manner. You have the same thing for deaths, attacks, characters destroyed, all kinds of stuff. The ones I would say are the most important for new players, or any player honestly, is the character injured, like I said, so you have time to react and see that one of your characters is close to dying. Enemy sighted, so this means that you will have time to prepare yourself and issue commands before a fight starts, very helpful. And also trap found, so if you're moving through a dungeon and one of your thieves detects a trap, you don't need to react to that find, like, oh, a trap, oh shit, and then you die. <laughs> um, this, this will make it so that when a trap is detected, the game immediately pauses and you can stop your characters in place, send your thief to disarm it, and then continue. It's a lot safer. Um, weapon unusable might also be handy. You also have the combat log for this. But this just means that if you are attacking an enemy with a weapon to which he is immune to, the game will automatically pause and let you know, wait, you are using a weapon that does nothing against this enemy, so do something about it. Okay, this might also be useful, but the, the core ones I would say is character injured, enemy sighted, and trap found. Okay, so... That's what I had to say about real-time with pause. It's a very simple mechanic, but it's a very, very important one. Use it. Let's talk about spellcasters. So, something that confuses a lot of new people is how to actually handle spellcasters by, by learning spells and how to cast the spells, how many can they cast, how does it work. Uh, so, I'm gonna show off an example of using a mage and a cleric. They are a little bit different, so I'm going to be starting off with my mage right here. So, the first thing we want to know is, if we have a mage character, we're going to have our mage book over here to the left, and if we click it, we're going to see uh, this menu. In this case, since I'm using a, a, load, a save game from a late stage in the game, you're going to be able to see a lot of spells, and these are the spells that my mage knows, and these are split by spell levels. Every spell has a level associated to it, okay? And you will unlock spell levels by leveling up your characters, okay? The higher your level, the higher level spells you will have access to. So, 
In this left section, it's going to show you the spells that your mage already knows. If you click on them, you are going to see a description of the spell here to the right. Okay, and if you're a new player, read. It's going to be very helpful. Um, but in order for us to actually start uh, knowing these spells and how to use them, there's a couple of things we need to know. So the first thing is, how do we actually get spells into our mage book? We need to learn them. In order to learn new spells as a mage, you are going to want to do it via scrolls. Okay? Uh, what does it say here? It doesn't actually say. But these are scrolls. Scrolls you can pick up by finding them scattered throughout the world um, in containers. Uh, enemies might carry them and when you kill them you can loot the scrolls from them. And you can also pick them up via vendors throughout the world. And the way you can use these scrolls there are two ways. The first way is you can simply purchase a scroll, equip the scroll in your quick item slot, click it and cast the spell. Okay? Yes, yes. So this would be one way of you to cast a spell. However, as you'll note, once you cast a spell from the scroll, the scroll is gone. And you still don't know that spell. The way to learn the spell, you will need to get the scroll, right-click the scroll, and then you're going to have this button right here, which is Write Magic. When you click Write Magic, it's going to show you this little pop-up, and it's going to say, you copy the spell to your spellbook. Or, it can also say, you failed to copy the spell to your spellbook. Because there is a chance that you might not learn the spell. And this is directly related to your intelligence score. The higher the intelligence, the more likely it is for your character to learn that spell. Also, the level of the character. If you are a level 1 character and you try to learn a level 9 spell, you will most likely fail. Okay? Um, in any case, once you learn the spell, it will now show up here, which was blindness, the one we just learned. And you now have it in your spell selection. However, just by knowing the spells doesn't actually mean you can cast them. So if I go to my spell menu, it's even grayed out. I can't cast any spell. Why? This is because of this bottom section right here and what it says right here. Memorizing. In Baldur's Gate and in Dungeons and Dragons in general, in order for you to cast spells, you need to first prepare them or memorize them. What this means is, you will need to select the spells you will want to have available to you while you are adventuring, and those are the spells you're going to be able to cast. And you have a certain amount of slots per level. So in this case, we have 8 spells available for level 1. So I could say something like, I want 2 blindness, uh, I want a shield, I want a spook, and I want a bunch of magic missiles, for example. This means that I will have available to me two blindness, four magic missiles, one shield, and one spook. They are all memorized. If I try to cast them, it still doesn't work. Why? Because after memorizing a spell, you will need to rest in order to have the spells available. And I will use this as an example. We're going to rest, which is this button right here. And by resting, what resting does is it will skip time, so you rest it for 8 hours. If you have healing spells prepared in some of your characters, it will heal anybody that's injured. And it will also replenish your spells. So, previously we had no spell, because we had just memorized them. Now that we rested, we have all of them available. They are not grayed out anymore. So if I go to my menu, they are now over here. You can just ignore this section over here, okay? This is from a mod, ignore these. <laughs> but here are our spells we just memorized. Two blindness, one shield, one spook, four magic missile. If I were to use this... Okay. By using my magic missile, I now only have three. If I go to my spellbook, 
one of them is going to be grayed out. The same thing. So if you would want to replenish this spell, you would need to rest. Keep in mind that if you are during a fight, in the middle of a fight I mean, you can't just lie down to sleep for 8 hours. <laughs> and this is simply a mechanic to kind of restrict you in the number of spells you have available during one resting period, let's say. So you rest, you go adventuring, while you are adventuring you have those spells available for you and when you need to replenish them you will need to rest. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, we rested, we can see all of them are now available. And like I just showed, if you are trying to cast a spell, the only thing you need to do is to go to your spell menu, select the spell you want to cast, click it, and then it, if it's a spell that does not target, for example this shield spell, because this one is affects the caster only, if you click it, you don't get any mouse changing, it will simply start casting the spell, it's showing right here. It, it didn't start yet because I'm in pause. But if it's a spell that targets, so targets one creature, you will need to aim it at something. So it's grayed out right now because it needs to target a character, so you have to pick a character in order to cast it. If it were an area of effect spell, like this one for example, you can target any kind of area you want and it will blow up in that area. So, let's move on to a, something a little bit different, which is my Cleric or even my Sorcerer. So, Clerics and Sorcerers don't need to learn spells. It's the same thing with a Druid or a Shaman, anything like that. Because these classes have innate access to magic. That, that's the lore reason, okay? But in, in gameplay terms, it means that the Sorcerer or a Cleric never get to learn spells. You can't just give a scroll to your cleric or a scroll to your sorcerer and have them learn it. You will simply gain spells as you level up. So in, in regards to a sorcerer, every time you level up you will get spells to select. You can choose new spells to learn from the list of existing spells. And for a cleric, as soon as you reach a certain level, you immediately unlock all of the spells of that level. So, for example, my cleric, once she starts the game, she will have access to level 1 spells, she will immediately have every single spell available for level 1. Once she reaches level 3, she's gonna get level 2 spells, all of them will be, avail will be available. And, as you level up, you are gonna get more casts per day. So, like I talked about with the memorization, with the example of Edwin, now he has 8 spells he can cast per resting period, but at the start of the game maybe he had like 3 or 4. Th these increase as the game goes on up to a certain point. I think 8 is the maximum. And then, as you can see here on level 9, I still only have 6 spells per rest. So you need to play with this, you need to handle and manage your resources, you can't just fireball every single little enemy in the game, you should kind of conserve your ammunition to when you really need it. Okay, and that's it in terms of learning spells. The only other thing I want to talk about was something I talked about in the, in the UI section already. If there's a spell you use a lot, for example Magic Missile, and you don't want to click the menu, look for the spell, and then choose it, you can create a shortcut for it. So these three here are shortcuts. If you right click, you can then choose the spell you want to shortcut. It's right here. And now you can just click this and use it. That's it for spell casting. Let's move on to our next section. Reputation. This is something that I thought was also relevant to talk about. It's this little stat right here. It can be pretty hidden. People might not even notice it while they are playing the game, except when you do something that actually increases or decreases your reputation. Every time you increase or decrease your reputation, it's going to show up in the log that it increased or decreased. 
and the way you can check it is by going to your character record and looking for the reputation score. Reputation can go between 1 and 20 and the lower you are, the more negatively perceived you are going to be by other NPCs throughout the world to a point that um, guards in cities, for example, might actually start attacking you. If you have a very good reputation, for example, popular or 20, which is, I don't know, even know, heroic or something, uh, people are gonna react to you in a much more favorable way. So this matters for uh, recruiting NPCs, companions, I mean, because if you are playing, for example, an evil party, which is my case, if your reputation gets very, very high, like 18 or 19 or God forbid 20, which should be a good thing, your evil companions are going to look at that as a sign of weakness and they are going to leave your party. Okay. However, if you drop your reputation to one, <laughs> for example, which I don't advise, but if you drop your reputation very low, your evil companions are going to be very happy. Likewise, if you have good companions, you want to improve your reputation to as high as possible. And if you drop it very low, they are going to leave. This is also why I said in the beginning that for a first playthrough for new players, I would advise you to pick a good character and, and mess around with good characters mostly um, because this can kind of confuse you if you are trying to play with evil people. Uh, reputation not only affects reactions, it will also affect um, discounts in stores. If you have a very good reputation, you're going to get a very high discount. If you have a low reputation, uh, I believe vendors will charge you more which throughout the course of the game is going to result in a lot of gold gained or gold lost. That's, I think, pretty much everything that, that there is to know about reputation. It's, it's mostly a, a role-playing thing, but its effects really are characters reacting to you. Uh, if you drop too low, guards in cities will start attacking you. And companions might leave your party. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so our next topic is going to be about party composition and companions. So uh, this is merely a, a suggestion that I make, kind of a recommendation. Uh, I would say that the best way to enjoy Baldur's Gate is with the full party, especially if you are playing the game for your first time or the first couple of times. Uh, the game has a lot of replayability the game has a lot of different companions and they bring a lot into your game, really. Uh, they bring the, every single companion, I think every single companion, I think every single companion has a quest. Uh, they have a lot of banter, both with you and between your own companions. Uh, they will have insight about several things happening around the world they may interject and help you out in certain quests, dialogues, they will give you hints, they will give you backstory. Um, you can even romance certain companions in the game. They, they just bring a lot of life into your party. So I would say that playing with the full party is really the way to go. Certain characters are just amazing, they are very, very enjoyable. Um, I won't say my favorite ones right now because I don't want to influence people. <laughs> um, but in any case, I do think that a full party is the best way to go. You can also play with more than one custom character. So naturally your main character will always be a custom character. But you can even have a party full with six custom characters. If you want to fine tune everything. Um, and sure, that, that works. But it's not going to be as complete of an experience as playing with your companions. Because if you play with custom characters, naturally you won't have the quests, you, you won't have the banter, you won't have the insight. All of that is going to be lost. So I would recommend playing with, your, uh, with the companions. Uh, the party size, honestly, I would recommend between 4 to 6. 
I wouldn't drop below 4 for the maximum enjoyability and also to be able to handle different things. Because usually in a game like this, and I'm going to talk about my personal preference, but I think it's also what is more adjusted to the majority of people. Uh, I would say that there are four main roles in, in a game like this. And this is similar to many RPGs. So I would always want a frontliner, and that would mean somebody who's capable of handling physical combat and withstand punishment, while also dishing out a lot of damage. So this would be someone like a fighter, a paladin, uh, a fighter multi-class, um, anything of that sort, you know, something reliable in the front line to hold the line. I would also always want um, an arcane caster. An arcane caster is something like a mage, or a sorcerer, or a bard. The bard is kind of like a multi-class, so I would say a mage or a sorcerer. First of all, because arcane magic is tremendously fun in Baldur's Gate, it's, it's awesome, <laughs> it's really, really awesome. And it will help you out immensely in, in numerous occasions. Arcane casters allow you to uh, debuff your opponents, buff your party, dispel effects, deal damage. Um, th there's, there's so much utility and combat prowess from arcane casters that I would always say to take at least one. And again, this is for new players, so that's a recommendation. Arcane caster, at least one. I would also say that you would want a support role, and that is usually performed by a cleric or a druid. I tend to prefer clerics, but, you know, whatever is your preference. Um, because a cleric will provide, again, a lot of buffs, a lot of healing, a lot of debuffs, um, and especially because there are certain things in the game that you really don't have a reliable way to deal with unless you have some help by magic means. Um, mages uh, or arcane casters and divine casters really play a very crucial role in Baldur's Gate. They are tremendously fun and they are very, very, very important. And for the final role, I would say some kind of thief. I would say a pure thief or a multi-class thief. In my opinion, um, I prefer a multi-class for a thief because pure class thieves will feel a little bit weak, especially if you are starting out the game and you don't really know how to exploit their full potential pure thieves are gonna feel weak. So something like a mage thief multi-class is gonna bring him a lot of utility or a fighter thief so you can have somebody else to be in the front lines while also helping out with thieving... Um, uh, what's the word? Th thieving abilities like detecting traps, dispelling illusions, uh, lock picking, lock doors, laying down traps. So all of that is useful and I really wouldn't play the game without having a thief present because there will be a lot of traps in the game, there will be a lot of closed containers and a thief will just be very, very helpful throughout the game. So naturally you can go be below four characters if you start multi-classing a lot or dual classing but like I said, I would not recommend that to a new player. Um, what I personally like to do, I like to have, this is very, very basic honestly, I like to have two frontliners, I, ha I like to have two support role slash tanky guys, okay, to hold out the midline while also dishing out damage and buffing, and I like to have two arcane casters in my party. So I will give you an example with this party. Um, I have Corgan as my main frontline guy, he's a, a pure fighter. I have Herdelis, who's a bard, so two frontliners, and this one has a bit of utility as well. For support, I have Viconia, which is a pure cleric, and I have Jan Janssen, who is my mage thief. So taking care of cleric duties and taking care of 
um, thieving duties with some extra utility added. And then finally I have Edwin and myself that I'm a sorcerer, so a sorcerer and a mage to take care of our arcane casting capabilities. So again, my recommendation to a new player, bring at least two people capable of fighting in the front line, have two people capable of supporting your party with thieving abilities and divine spell casting, like a cleric, and then I would say two arcane casters, two mages or a bard and a mage or a sorcerer and a bard or a bard and a, a sorcerer, whatever combination you want. Um, the roles, I think, are pretty straightforward, right? The frontliners, you are going to want them in the frontline fighting. You're going to have your arcane casters in the back. You don't want them taking damage because they are very squishy and they die very quickly. And you can see the difference. You have a mage with 72 hit points, while my fighter has 200 hit points. So that, that is reason alone to keep your arcane casters in the back line. Um, also something to say about companions here. There are a lot of companions. Uh, I might give a suggestion about which companions would be cool for the first playthrough, but that might be a different video, honestly. Um, but something that I do want to touch is companion alignment. Because your companions also have an alignment, not only your character. Okay? So, if you don't want to mess things up, and if you want to play it without conflicts, I would say don't stray too far from your alignment, okay? Or, or I would say don't stray too far from your companion's alignments. As an example, if I have Corgan right here and he's a chaotic evil character, I would not mix him up with a, a good aligned character. You can do it. There are several characters that doesn't. That's not a problem. But again, if you're just starting out the game, I would recommend. If you have evil characters in your party, stick with evil and or neutral. If you are playing with good characters in your game, stick with good or neutral. Otherwise, some of your companions might start conflicting because they don't like each other's point of view and they might actually start fighting each other and kill each other. <laughs> or they will even say something like, if you want to keep this guy in the party, I'm leaving and they will leave forever. Okay, so stick to your alignment. I think it's the, the best way to approach that. Okay, and that's it for our party alignment and party composition and companions. Now we're going to talk about AI. So this is something that I briefly covered when I was showing you guys the, the user interface. And I showed you the button here for the party AI. And this you can toggle it on or off. So it's very, uh, you know, on or off. <laughs> Um, so you either have all of your characters using AI or it's turned off for every single one. This can be useful, especially when you have, when you want to have absolute fine control over what your characters are making. You want to make sure they only attack the person you tell them to. You want to make sure they only cast the spells you tell them to and nothing on their own. So turning this off can be very helpful. Uh, I will just give you an example which I'm sure is going to happen to you guys eventually. If for some reason one of your mages, for example Edwin, um, does not have a ranged weapon and he only has like a quarter staff or something, if you did not customize his AI, he is going to be programmed to attack enemies on site. And what that means is there's going to be a fight over there with a couple of fighters and Edwin or any kind of mage is going to want to try and get into that fight as well. Which is something that you don't want. Because if your enemies decide to turn on him, he's a very easy target and you will die. So you want to make sure that your mages are in the back line and for that reason you might want to have party AI off or his own party AI um, or his own specific AI tuned to a different way. So I will go over how you can customize the party AI for your characters and then I will also give my recommendation for each kind of role. So in order to customize the AI of your companions, you just select the oh, companion you want, you go to the character records, and then you can customize right here. In customization, you are going to have, in this case, since he is an NPC companion, you can only customize his script 
and the script is actually is AI script. So by default, I believe you're going to have advanced AI turned on. There's a bunch of different AIs here. I won't go through all of them. You can investigate them at your own will. But the usual one and default one is the advanced AI. By using the advanced AI, there's a couple of stuff you can customize. For example, this default one is telling Edwin that when he is idle, when you're not giving him any kind of command, if he sees enemies, he is going to attack them. So he will attack enemies on sight. You can also say prefer a melee weapon or prefer a ranged weapon. Something to keep in mind uh, regarding this, because this would make a lot of sense, right? He's a spellcaster, you want him in the back, so have him use a ranged weapon. If your ranged weapon runs out of ammunition, which does happen, even though it says prefer, it does not say only use, if he runs out of ammo, he is going to go into the fight and try to punch enemies to death, <laughs> which is ill-advised. In any case, attacking enemies and prefer ranged weapons would be a good start. You can then also have something like use items, uh, use special abilities, use offensive and defensive spells. These are all things that could make sense for, for example, a mage. And what this means is, for example, if he runs low on HP and if you have a potion equipped on your quick item, he is going to automatically drink it so he doesn't die. So why is this good? This is good because it will take some of the micromanagement away from you. You don't need to give commands for every single little thing in the game. It, it, it lowers the burden on the part of the player. But at the same time, it might be something you don't want. Because uh, if, for example, Edwin ran low on HP at a certain point and he automatically uses a potion because he's on low HP, you might not want him to do that at that specific moment. Because if Edwin uses a potion, that will consume his action for his round. If his action for the round has been consumed, that means he cannot do anything else like, for example, cast a spell. And usually, especially on a mage, casting a spell, especially a defensive spell, is usually more effective than using a potion to try and heal. Okay, so this can be good, it will lower your actions in the game, but you lose some control and it might be bad for you at some times. The same thing happens for special abilities, offensive spells and defensive spells. Uh, this might be handy, you're gonna start seeing your character tossing uh, magic missiles and fireballs and all that against his enemies. Sure, it can be cool, you don't have to click so much, you can just kind of watch him do his thing. But at the same time, uh, you don't have unlimited spells. He might start casting uh, a powerful spell against an enemy you consider to be weak. So you just wasted a very powerful spell against something that doesn't matter. And then in the next fight, you won't have it available. Or against a different enemy in our fight, you won't have it available. So it's always the pro and con of you don't have to micromanage so much versus you are losing control over what's going on in the game. Okay, same thing for defensive spells, special abilities, all that. So now I will give you guys uh, what is, in my opinion, the best AI to have in your characters. This is very subjective. Uh, if you should tune, you should fine tune the AI to whatever is your liking. If you don't like to micromanage so much, I would say set some of these automatic. If you want to have control, don't use it as much. Okay, so, like I was saying, for my particular preference, honestly, on a mage, or a sorcerer, or any kind of arcane caster that's not good in, in physical combat, I just say none. Okay? If, if you are playing in Baldur's Gate 1, you can actually keep them with attack enemies and prefer ranged weapons, because you will usually have... Uh, something like a sling or a dart or a throwing dagger equipped and it works fine for the most part But once you get to Baldur's Gate 2 There might be some melee weapons that you actually want to have equipped So you can get its passive bonuses 
And if that's the case, you don't want your characters to attack at all. So, in my opinion, in Baldur's Gate 1, mages, sorcerers, anything like that, attack enemies, prefer ranged weapons, and everything else off. Once you start getting to mid Baldur's Gate 2, and you want to use a melee weapon because of the buffs, and I'll just give an example here, so something like the Staff of the Magi, this is a kind of a late game weapon, but still, it's gonna give you extra armor class, extra saving throws, it will make you invisible, immune to charm, protection from evil, you know, so you might want to have this on. Because if you are using, for example, a sling, you're not going to be doing much damage anyway. You are not going to hit very often because your Thacko is not as good as your other characters. Your damage is pitiful. Let's compare this one with Corgans, for example. So it's not really worth it sometimes to have a ranged weapon equipped. So I would say that once you get these items that you want to have on and they are melee weapons, I would just say no AI. You control the spells they cast, you control the way they move, done. For fighter types, I prefer to have advanced AI, attack enemies. That's it. Nothing else. Um, this will make it so if there are enemies in the vicinity, your fighters are going to charge at them and they will fight them until they are dead. And once they kill their enemy, they are going to automatically move to the next one. So, very basic, but it's a fighter, so that's exactly what I want him to do. Go in and fight. If I want to trigger some kind of ability, for example, Berserking on, on Corgan, I can just do it myself. Again, if you don't want to have that micromanagement, you could just say, use special abilities and the character will use it automatically. But my preference is attack enemies. I don't prefer melee weapons or ranged weapons. Uh, I prefer that when I tell him use this weapon, he will use that weapon, be it melee or ranged, and that's it. He won't swap uh, by his own will, which is my preference. Uh, Herdelis is a fighter mage, or, I mean, he's a, he's a blade, he's a bard, but he, he's kind of a fighter and he's kind of a mage. So for me, the AI is going to be the same thing. Advanced AI, attack enemies, this shouldn't actually be here. So just attack enemies. Viconia, she's a cleric, so she would be a support role, but she can also kind of fight. Uh, this kind of changes, depending on what I want. If I have her built more as a tank, which she really isn't right now, this should be here, <laughs> which she, she really isn't right now, I prefer to have her without any AI, because she's going to be acting mostly like a spellcaster. She's going to be using her spells from afar, and I want her to be safe. If I built her more like a tank, or if she were, for example, a fighter cleric, then I would also just say advanced AI, attack enemies, and that's it. Very simple. Now, something special to note about clerics. You can also want to have turn undead on. Turn undead is an ability that you can use with a cleric to turn enemies, enemy undead, in the area. This can either uh, charm them to fight to your side if you are evil aligned, or if you are good, it can scare them away and it can even destroy them straight up. So sometimes, uh, if you want to use turn undead, you can just activate this. And once she will, and once she sees undead in the area, she will automatically start using her ability turn undead. So this one, right here. Okay, that's it for my cleric. And now for the last one, which is the, the one that's kind of different, I guess. Uh, Jan Janssen is a mage thief. So sometimes I will want him to fight, and that's perfectly reasonable. Sometimes I might just want him as a support spellcaster and I will turn this off. Uh, but I will only swap this around. Either attack or don't attack. But more importantly here, we also have the fine traps. And this is pretty much the only AI that I like using in my characters. If you are a thief, I want that when he is idle, I want him to look for traps and illusions. So this means that... If you are playing with Jan Janssen, this is his button here to find traps, tech illusion. 
I'm moving around, I have this on. So AI is turned off. Let's say I don't have the AI on. That means he will not automatically use fine traps. And this also means that if you forget to click the button again, you will not be detecting traps at all and you get, might get yourself killed. So by having AI on, since Jan Janssen isn't doing anything else, he automatically... Uh, stop turning that. He, he automatically uh, starts taking traps. And this is the kind of automation that I don't mind at all, right? <laughs> so if he's not doing anything, look for traps. If he is doing something else, he will not be looking for traps. So this will be my, my preference and my recommendation if you want to have some control while also having your characters perform basic functions while they are idle or they are in combat. Thieving abilities. So something also important in your party is your thief. You will usually want to have a thief. I recommend always having a thief in your party, be it a pure class or a multi-class. Um, but we're going to talk about what they can do. So thieves will always have like these three buttons available to them. This first one, which is like a crosshair, is find traps and detect illusion. Then you have thieving, which I know is a little bit generic. And then you will also have stealth. So starting from the right, stealth is pretty much what you expect it to be. Once you press this button, your thief will attempt to hide in shadows. And if he succeeds, he is then invisible for the duration. So he will remain invisible until he takes an action or until he gets spotted by some meme. Because you always have to keep rolling every time you are trying to hide in shadows to make sure that you remain in shadows. What affects this is his skills. So in this case, a thief can have open locks, which is to pick uh, to lock pick certain locked doors or containers, find traps, you know, you know to find traps in the world, <laughs> pickpocket. This is to steal from uh, any kind of NPC, move silently and hide in shadows. They are pretty much the same thing. So they will both allow you to go in stealth and they will both allow you to remain in stealth. Detect Illusion will allow you to detect invisible things in the area, such as enemies. And Set Traps will allow you to lay traps on the floor. The higher the value of Set Traps, the less likely you are to fail setting the trap. So you can actually raise these values above 100, for example, like over here, but it's usually a waste. If you have Set Traps, Detect Illusion, uh, Find Traps and Open Locks at 100, you will never fail any of these things. You will always open a lock, you will always find a trap, always detect an illusion and will always set a trap. Okay, you will never fail if your score in these skills are at 100. The exceptions here are pickpocket. Pickpocket, in order for you to pretty much never fail, you would have to have this score at something like 250. And even then, there is still a chance you might fail. Okay, keep that in mind. For move silently and hide in shadows, you usually also want to have this like 200 each in order to make sure that you never fail your stealth. If it's lower, like mine, it can be a little bit unreliable. Especially if your character is in uh, an open area with direct sunlight, because it does affect it, he is not, really, not very likely to be able to hide in shadows. If he's in a shadow, and if he's away from anything else, it is more likely you will be able to hide. Um, what else do I want to talk about my thief over here? Ah, right. So, my other button here, thieving, this is what will allow me to um, pickpocket characters. You can pickpocket neutral characters, you can pickpocket shopkeepers, enemies, you can pickpocket whatever you want. There's a chance you will succeed, there's a chance you will fail. If you succeed, you will steal some item from their inventory. If you fail, they will notice you, turn hostile, and they will fight you. <laughs> uh, this button also works for if you find a trap on the ground, the way to disarm it is 
click on thieving, click on the trap, and you will try to disarm the trap. Okay, this button does both pickpocketing as well as disarming traps. If you also find a locked container or a door that you want to lockpick, again, same button. The thieving button is also what will allow you to unlock locked doors. And finally, we have find traps and tech delusion. This one is something that you pretty much can always have on while you are idle. And what it does is it will check for traps in the area close by to your thief. If the trap is detected, it will show up as a red square or a red rectangle indicating where the trap is. Uh, you should have auto pause turned on for this so that when the trap is detected, your characters will immediately stop, the game is paused, and you can then disarm them before stepping on the trap. It's also useful for the detect illusion purpose because some enemies in the game will like to, to become invisible. So something like a thief, an assassin, they will want to be invisible in order to backstab you and a lot of mages will also love to go invisible in order to be safe, cast their buffs and then just nuke you with spells. If you have Detect Illusion at 100, every single round you will dispel the enemies that are invisible in the area. Very strong ability, a lot of people neglect this, uh, but it's, it, is this, it is certainly something that you should use if you want to dispel invisibility in the area. Let's talk about rounds and turns. So, the way that time moves forward in Baldur's Gate is represented by rounds. A round represents a minute of game time, and in real time it represents 6 seconds. A turn represents 10 rounds, so it would mean 60 seconds. So that means one round is 6 seconds, one turn is a minute in real time. Why does this matter? A lot of times you are going to find uh, certain spells in your spellbook. I'm going to say, for example, shield here, which is going to say that the duration is one hour. But like I just talked about, this is one hour game time. It will not actually last one hour of our real time. One hour would be 60 rounds because one round represents one in-game minute. So 60 times a round, that would mean six minutes, 360 seconds. So one hour would represent that. There are other spells, uh, and this is not really uh, a very intuitive or familiar way to show it. I don't really like it that much, but just know that. One hour means 60 rounds, which means six minutes. You have other spells that last like nine hours, so yeah. <laughs> Make the math, do the math if you want to. In my opinion, it just lasts a long time. But there are other spells, like for example Grease here, which are going to say that their duration lasts for 3 rounds plus 1 round per level. So this way you know that if you cast Grease, it's going to stay in place for 3 rounds, or 18 seconds, and it will also scale with your level. So the higher level you are, the longer the duration of this spell will be. This is actually something very good. Spells that scale are usually better than spells that don't scale. The other thing I want to talk about um, regarding turns and rounds is that your characters can only perform a single action per round. There is one exception to this, which is called Improved Alacrity, but I wouldn't say that's for beginners, so I'm just going to skip it. So, what do I mean by an action per round? If you want to cast spells, for example, I have here Magic Missile. This is a very quick spell. The casting time is 1. This casting time, I'm also going to talk about it, why not? This means this will last 1 tenth of a round. So your casting time can go between 1 and 10. And that means, you know, it's either going to take a portion of your round time to cast or it's going to take your entire round to cast, if it were 10. I think 9 is actually the limit, but 9 would represent the full round. But this one, you can cast it very quickly. So if I cast this at Corgan, for example, I cast a spell, and I want to cast another one. But if you'll see, he's not casting it. 
right? And he's not bugged. <laughs> This is what I mean by you can only realize a single action, you can only perform a single action per round. If you tell Edwin, for example, to cast a spell, he won't be able to cast another spell until this present round has finished. Which is you saw. I told him cast magic missiles, and then when I told him cast the second one, he, he had to wait a little bit before he started casting again. The only exception to this is... Uh, normal attacks, so basic attacks, auto attacks. You can perform auto attacks while also performing your action for the round. But something that you can't do, for example, we're gonna use Jan Janssen for this example here. Uh, let's say, let me damage him a little bit. Okay. So let's say Jan is injured, I want to heal him, I don't want him to die. So I will want to drink a potion. But first, before I got hit, I had just cast a magic missile, for example. So if I cast my magic missile right now, and I pause the game so we can see this, if I try to drink a potion, you see the symbol right here, he's not gonna drink it until the current round is over. And there we go. And the same thing works uh, vice versa. So. If he just drank this potion, if he just drank, not drank, <laughs> if he just drank his potion, if I want to cast a spell right now, I'm going to have to wait for the round to be over before he casts a spell again. There we go. Okay, so this pretty much shows you how rounds and turns work, how time moves forward, and how you can manage your, your spell casters and pretty much any caster. Because even on someone like a fighter, for example, you might want to cast Berserking or Enrage. This is an ability that, that Berserkers have. But you also have other abilities. These are, these are things you can pick up along the way as you level up. But if you use Berserking and you want to try and use another ability, you can't. You need to wait for the round to be over in order to cast the other ability. So, pretty much any kind of action that isn't an auto attack, you can only perform it once per round. So, something you can do is, for example, you can cast a spell, and then while you wait a little bit, you can just move your character around, take him out of danger until the round ends, and then you can cast again. Something that you can also use... Uh, I, I don't really use it because it, it would be a little bit annoying because it's gonna trigger a lot of times is if you go to the auto pause menu you you actually have a, a option here for end of round so whenever a party member reaches the end of a combat round the game will automatically pause I think this will only show up if you are in combat I don't think it shows up if you are idle but if you want to see the end of round coming up, you can have this enabled and as soon as the round ends for a particular character, the game pauses and you know you can cast another spell or drink a potion or use an ability, anything like that. It can be useful. Personally, I don't do it because it, the game will pause way too much and it gets a little bit annoying. But just know it exists and if you want to use it, go for it. Uh, I'm gonna heal Corgan because I don't like seeing my characters in low health, even if I'm just making a video. <laughs> um, but yeah, for example, heal is a spell that has a long cast time. And you just saw it took a while for her to cast a spell. It has a cast time of 9. So it pretty much takes up um, the cleric's entire round to get this spell off. Okay, and I think that's it for time rounds, turns, durations, and actions per round. Okay, now we are going to talk about roles. Uh, not roles like uh, a party role, but roles of rolling dice. <laughs> so, like any Dungeons & Dragons game, and Baldur's Gate is no exception, the way that most things are calculated in-game are by simulating the throwing of dice. There are several kinds of dice uh, with several different numbers of faces. So you have 
uh, your typical six-sided dice, which are the, the usual ones you, you know of, but then you also have four-sided dice, you have 20-sided, 100-sided, 10-sided, there's a lot of different uh, styles of dice. Most things in Baldur's Gate are going to be determined by the roll of dice. As an example, Fate us all. if you pick up a weapon, you will note that the damage isn't what you are probably used to seeing in other games. It doesn't say that it deals 20 damage. It says it deals 1d4 damage. So what does 1d4 mean? This means the roll of a dice with four faces. Okay, so one roll, that's the part to the left, of a dice with four sides. Okay. So this, dam uh, this damage, this weapon can deal between 1 and 4 damage, plus 1. This one is also always guaranteed. But the dice damage is going to be between 1 and 4, and the damage you do is determined by the roll of the dice. There are other weapons, larger weapons, for example, which can say something like, it deals 1d12. So the dam I'm just going to ignore the extra plus 5, okay, for, for this example. But this here is guaranteed damage. Even if you roll the 1, it's always going to deal at least 6. But focusing on, on the part of the rolls. This one, for example, doesn't say 1d4, it says 1d12, which means it's going to roll a 12-sided dice, or 12-sided die. So it will deal between 1 and 12 damage. Okay, another example to just show the final thing I wanted to show. And hopefully I have a weapon that shows this. Uh, yeah, okay. So there are others which are going to say 2d4 or 2d6 or it could be 3 or whatever. <laughs> but this means that this one is a roll of two dice, of two four-sided dice. So at minimum you would deal 2 damage if both dice roll the 1 and at most it would deal 8 damage because both dice roll the 4. Okay, it's very simple but you do have to think about these things in terms of rolling dice. That's also why the damage of the weapons right here is going to show you a range of damage. It's not just saying it deals 24, it deals between 17 and 24 because naturally not only do you have the roll of the dice, but then you have bonuses. You have a bonus to damage, you have a bonus from your strength, you have a bonus from proficiencies, etc, etc, etc. In terms of attacking an enemy character, to I'm going to use an example here of Mr. Edwin attacking Corgan. It's also determined by a dice roll. So in this case, Edwin roll the d20. For attack rolls it's always a 20-sided dice or a 20-sided die. In this case Edwin rolled a 3 plus is 2 from his bonus. It adds them up and he is missing because Corgan has a very high AC like we talked about in the AC section. Um, he can he can barely hit Corgan. I think at this point he can only hit Corgan on a 19 or a 20, which is very unlikely. Oh, on a 20, yeah. So another thing to note is that while thinking about rolling the dice, if you roll a 1 in terms of attack rolls, that is considered a critical miss and it will always miss, even if you have a bonus of 300 to hit. If you roll a 1, you will miss. And if you roll a 20, you will always hit. So even if Edwin had uh, a Thacko of 50, which is impossible and horrible, and Corgan had uh, an AC of negative 50, which means they would never hit, or Edwin would never hit him, a 20 will always hit. A 20 also means that it's a critical strike, and the damage is going to be doubled. Unless you have a helmet. Helmets protect against critical hits. This means it will always hit, but you will only take normal damage. And here in the log, 
if you have this option enabled, which in my opinion you should, in the options menu, gameplay, feedback, you can also customize what you want to see in the log. So in this case, I'm seeing the two hit rolls, I'm seeing actions, state changes, combat information, all this stuff. And honestly, I, I would say if you're a new player, have all of this enabled. This will allow you to see everything that's going on. You're going to get a lot of information. It's very, very helpful. And we could also see Corgan attacking Edwin and see how different this would be. Yeah, so <laughs> so Corgan has a lot of bonus to hit. Edwin doesn't have that much of an AC, so he's easily hit and he is killed. Um, so this also happens for spells. Like I discussed before, you have several spells that give you a, a chance to save, because there's a saving throw. And what this means is, if somebody casts a spell that allows a saving throw, your character is once again going to roll a, a 20-sided dice. If the roll is below your saving throw value, you will not save against the spell. If you roll above your saving throw value, you will save against the spell. This is why having such a low value is awesome. So, for example, Corgan is at negative 2 versus death. This means he will never fail a save versus death. The lower you get, the better it is. Um, thinking about other stuff. Ah, even on spells. Uh, sorry. So, even on spells, you will see the information about damage also in dice rolls. So, like right here. This spell evaporates, yada yada yada, and it will inflict 1d8 damage per level of the caster. So this means that for every level of your character, you are going to roll a, an 8-sided die, and the result is going to be the damage you deal. Okay, so that's it for rolls. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about weapons. So in the game, you are going to find many, many different weapons. And some of them are going to be basic weapons, others are going to be enchanted weapons. So this is relevant um, for a couple of reasons. The first thing I want to touch is the type of damage that your weapons deal. In this example, I'm using a Warhammer. This is a very basic weapon. You can get it at the start of the game. Um, it's going to show you what the weapon does. But what's interesting here is this, crushing. This is the type of, of damage that this weapon deals. It's always going to be to the right of the damage amount. Warhammers are blunt weapons. They will deal crushing damage. If you take something like an axe, it's going to deal slashing damage. If you have some kind of throwing weapon, this, this is an axe as well, the game considers it, since you are throwing it, as a missile weapon. Same thing for an arrow or a sling or whatever. So different weapons will have different kinds of of damage types. This is relevant because certain enemies will be more resistant to certain kinds of um, damage type than others. The very classical example, if you have a skeleton and you are trying to kill your skeleton with a dagger or a scimitar or with arrows, you are not going to be very effective because you're, you're, you're stabbing between the bones and you're shooting arrows between the ribcage and, <laughs> and all that stuff. However, if you hit him with a hammer, uh, you're going to break some bones. So a skeleton is going to be resistant to slashing and piercing and missile, but you will have no protection against crushing damage. Likewise, there will be some other enemies which might be resistant to crushing and they might be weak to slashing. So something like, uh, I don't know, a bear. A bear is, should be resistant to crushing, but he should take full damage from a slashing weapon. Um... The other thing I want to, to mention is the level of enchantment of weapons. So this one, being a basic weapon, just says Warhammer, has no enchantment, or you can consider this an enchantment level of zero. While other weapons, uh, for example this one, is going to say Namara plus two. So this plus two here 
means that this weapon has an enchantment level of 2. This is relevant because not only will this give you some combat bonuses, you, you have a tackle bonus and you also have some damage bonus, but there are also some enemies that might be immune to non-magical weapons. And you even have some enemies which are immune to weapons that have a level of enchantment up to a certain value. So, as an example, there are enemies in the game which can only be hit by weapons enchanted of plus 3 or higher. So if you hit them with a normal weapon, or a plus 1 or a plus 2, it's always just going to show in the combat log right here, this enemy is immune. I think I might even have an example here. Uh, oh, I don't think I do. Damn it. <laughs> but yeah, if you hit somebody immune, it's going to show in the combat log they are immune and you will do zero damage. So, and, ah, and if you hit somebody that's not immune but is resistant, it's going to show you dealt, let's say, 20 damage, but then it's going to say 10 damage resisted. This means that the enemy is resistant to a certain degree to the kind of weapon damage you are dealing. In these cases, be the enemy immune or resistant, you might consider swapping your weapon in order to be able to actually deal damage. As an example, if you go up against somebody who is immune to slashing, you are going to have to swap weapons on Corgan. Otherwise, Corgan is going to slash away and he will do zero damage the entire time. So that's why I would always also recommend having another weapon in your inventory. Like, for example, if your main weapon is a slashing weapon, I don't know, keep a hammer in your inventory. You might want to swap to it if you find an enemy that's, that needs to be hit by a hammer. I think golems are a good example. Um, but yeah, so this is what I want to, to, keep, to have you guys keep in mind. There are different weapon types, there are different weapon damage types, Enemies will resist different kinds of damage and some of them might be immune to something different. So if you are fighting somebody and you see in the combat log damage resisted or the enemy is immune, pause the game, understand what's going on and adapt to the situation. Swap it to a, a higher level enchantment weapon or swap it to a different damage type. And that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about weapons. Okay, uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I had for tips for new players trying to get into Baldur's Gate. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I tried to remember every single thing that I struggled with when I started playing. Uh, I took into account all of the comments you guys left me in my videos asking questions and trying to understand how things worked. Uh, things that my friends had asked me and also threads I saw on Reddit of people asking for help. Uh, I think I covered pretty much all of the basics for the gameplay and the UI. Uh, I know that this UI is a little bit outdated. It's not probably what we are used to seeing in modern games nowadays. But maybe I'm biased naturally because I'm used to it. But I think it's a very usable interface. It's quite simple to use. It's easy. Um, and once you get the hang of it, you are going to have no problem. So... Uh, if there's something else that I did not cover in the video and you want to know about, or even if there's something that I did cover in the video, but you want some further detail or some other explanation about how it works, um, what something is, leave a comment below. I'll try to help out as much as I can. And... I don't know, I would say that <laughs> if you like the content, uh, consider subscribing for more videos coming out. I'm putting out playthroughs of several video games. I have my own playthroughs of Baldur's Gate 1, uh, Siege of Dragon Spear, Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Ball already all upload to the channel. So you can also check those out if there's a specific area you want some help with. I have several guides. Uh, so yeah, consider subscribing if you want to get notified about other videos that I put out, be it Baldur's Gate or other kind of gaming content. Uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope this was helpful to some of you. Um, have fun in your runs. If you are just trying out Baldur's Gate, if you want to start seeing what it's about, it really is 
in my opinion, the greatest classic RPG you can ever play. It's really amazing. So I wish you a fun run. I hope you guys enjoy it and have fun. Uh, feel free to come back and comment and say how it's going or what happened or, or if you need help. I will try to help out. And I hope to see you guys in some other video. And until then, stay safe, everyone.